neorealismo cinematografico italiano è stato sempre, fin dalla sua nascita... The Italian neorealistic movement in film has been the subject of incessant debate and a very mysterious object since its very beginnings. We worked personally on some of the initial theories when it was first born in the years 1945 to 1947. And even we were surprised at the rampant tendency to see cinematic neorealism as a unified body, a, a single school. This occurred in spite of differences among the various directors in the movement. Roberto Rossellini, Luchino Visconti, Vittorio De Sica, Giuseppe De Santis, Renato Castellani, Alberto Latuada, Luigi Zampa, and Pietro Germi, as well as those of the previous generation, Alessandro Blasetti and Mario Camerini, and young people like me, the latest recruits to neorealism. Federico Fellini's famous film La Strada was defined as spiritualistic by the most rigorous Italian neorealist critics. As far as they were concerned, the film replaced the social world surrounding man with the mystery of the existential. At the beginning of the 50s, La Strada was seen as the final example of neorealistic language, a sort of gravestone for the movement. But both for Sadul, the major Marxist-oriented film critic, and for Soviet critics, the film was part of neorealism's universe and upheld its principles. The close attention paid to the dignity of man, its call to the principles of solidarity and communication between human beings. There is general agreement that Italy changed course and began drawing inspiration from the currents crossing Europe only around 1953-54-55. And this happened only when Michelangelo Antonioni's films appeared, along with those starring Ingrid Bergman, directed by Rossellini, and with Senso, that great realistic fresco by Luchino Visconti. It was at that point that Italian cinema found inspiration in the currents of existentialism on the one hand, and in the Marxist area on the other, in the considerations on history and critical realism. The development, crisis and end of neorealism will be dealt with in later episodes as we explore the decade that witnessed the flowering of neorealism, the years from 1942-43 to 1953-54. We'll start right from the beginning because even though any division of history into historical periods must be treated with reservation, there is no other way of endowing the years 1942-43 with some indicative meaning that will help us talk about a movement we defined as complex and heterogeneous right from the beginning. Fascism underwent a serious crisis during those years. And they were also years that witnessed a singular and unforeseen agreement within various intellectual groups. This meeting of minds covered themes that were in opposition to the fascist regime's official policy on the arts and to the general nature of Italian cinema. The debate and discussion took place on the pages of the film reviews, Cinema, Bianco e Nero, Sigira, and on the arts pages of a few weeklies put out by GUF, the university students' organization during the fascist period. Le convergenze erano per esempio sul rifiuto del cinema dei telefoni bianchi, cosiddetto per la... The agreement came from a common refusal of Italy's so-called telefoni bianchi, literally white telephones cinema, so-called for the elegant Hollywood-type sitting rooms that frequently displayed this object. A status symbol more typical of Hollywood or Central European mansions than of normal middle-class Italian homes. Oppure sul rifiuto del film musicale o del film di...
contributors to these periodicals also agreed on the positive value of certain naturalist films that had made their appearance so frequently on the Italian film scene in the 1910s and 1920s. Films such as Assunta Spina or Sperduti nel Buio. There was also agreement as to the value of some of the early works of Vittorio De Sica, De Robertis, Amleto Palermi, Poggioli, and Franciolini. These critics also approved of the particular attention Blasetti and Camerini paid in their major films to lower middle and working class settings. These intellectuals also admired the films directed by Mario Soldati and Castellani and Latuada's first films. The stricter realists among us tended to discriminate against such films, but we had a great deal of respect for the formal value that was their distinguishing characteristic. Other affinities and similarities are to be found in the documentary production of directors like Pozzi Bellini and Francesco Pasinetti. But everyone's symbol was Lucchino Visconti's Ossessione. The film came out in 1943, but had already become a cult film during the months when it was being made. Appoggiati qui sulla mia spalla. Stai bene così? Eh sì, sto bene. Tu non puoi sapere quello che si prova. Non è tanto per avere un figlio, ma per quello che si sente. Tra poco la mia pancia sarà grossa. Non mi importa niente di diventare brutta. Anzi, voglio che tutti lo vedano. Questa è la vita, Gino. Sì, questa è la vita finalmente. Lontani da quella casa. A quest'ora forse saranno arrivati e rovisteranno tutto, tutte le stanze. E se ci prendessero? Tu non saresti più qui con me, Gino? Non preoccuparti di questo. Vedrai che tutto andrà bene. E poi il destino ci aiuterà. Non può abbandonare due come noi che stanno per avere un figlio. Stai tranquilla. D'ora innanzi penserò io a tutto. I padroni. Eh? A Scardovari. Scardovari? Sono andati con l'automobile? Sei proprio sicura? Andiamo, non perdiamo tempo. Bisogna avere pazienza, sali dietro. Cerca di passare. 
passare. Questo odore di nafta mi dà così noia. Chiudi il vetro. <ride> usarmi dei riguardi speciali. Ho visto di certe donne che hanno passato dei guai perché si strapazzavano. Ma a me non può accadere nulla, vero? Se no, perché sentirei i miei seni diventare ogni giorno più grossi? Non è vero, Gino? la macchina Costa. Andiamo. The convergence in taste that developed in the years from 1940 to 1942 in certain reviews such as Bianco e Nero, Cinema and Sigira, around certain films and concentrating later on a film like Ossessione, helped draw the borders around an extremely vast territory where people of various poetic and stylistic tendencies and members of different generations became friends, accomplices and fellow travelers. Understandings that had been unthinkable a few years or a few months before were worked out. Who would have guessed, for example, that Roberto Rossellini, a director of various fascist regime propaganda films, such as La Nave Bianca or L'Uomo della Croce, was to make the most explosive film of the immediate post-war period, Roma Città Aperta, Open City. raccomandasse. I tedeschi avevano portato il fidanzato a via d'asso. Stia tranquilla, ci penso io, gli ho detto. Ci aveva un par di cosce, ragazzi. <ride> Alt! Mani in alto. Ci ho il permesso. Tipografo. Ah. Tipografo. Sì, guarda il documento. Va bene. A casa è svelto. Grazie. Wiedersehen, Kapitano, e grazie. Guten Abend. 
Auf morgen nicht vergessen. Sie? Ho fatto un po' tardi, ma hanno voluto accompagnarmi a casa per forza. In fondo non c'è niente di male, no? Oh, ciao, ciao Francesco. Ti è andata bene, eh? Per questa volta sì, la padrona di casa e Nannina sono state bravissime. Lo sai che sono tornati stamattina e hanno buttato per aria tutta casa? Hanno perso tempo, non c'era niente. Mi ha detto Don Pietro che è stata Pina che ti ha aperto, eh? Sì, è stata molto gentile. Come ti pare? Fai bene a sposarmi. Mm. Al principio mi aveva preso per un poliziotto, mi ha trattato malissimo. <ride> me lo immagino. Sai che Don Pietro ha conosciuto pure Gino? Ah sì, mi fa piacere. Cosa ha detto lui del mio affare? È preoccupato. Oggi te dovevi incontrare col vecchio. Quando è arrivato? Ieri sera, ma tu non lo devi vedere. Ha detto Gino che per qualche tempo devi rompere ogni rapporto col centro. E ha ragione, ma dopo mesi di lavoro dover restare bloccato, eh, io non riesco a capire come mi abbiano pescato. Bisognerebbe cercare di scoprire che cosa sanno sul mio co. Beh, eh, ci proveremo, ma è difficile avere informazioni da via tasso. Se fosse la questura... Mm. Speriamo che Don Pietro abbia trovato l'amico di Italia Cozzi. Speriamo di sì. Ah, ti ho portato il giornale. È venuto bene, no? Quante copie? 12.000. Questa è Pina. Ciao, come va? Soltanto in pensiero per Marcello. È sparito. Come è sparito? Eh, l'ho cercato dappertutto il palazzo, non c'è sta... Sarà dello moletto? Ma che non c'è nemmeno lì. E anche Otello, il figlio della soradele della siciliana, non c'è sta... E dove saranno andati? La paura mia è che sono usciti. A quest'ora, col coprifuoco. Sarebbe meglio che entriamo una volta. C'ha ragione, entra prima. Ah, siete qui, brutte canaglie, eh? Sono tornati! A scalzoni! Adesso facciamo! Adesso mi sconcioglio dalle feste, brutte carogne, fammi morire da crematore! Vado un momento dell'A, se no succede un macello. Guarda come si sono ridotti! Dove siete stati? Da Romoretto! Non è vero, non ci stava nessuno su! Stavamo giù! Giù dove? Ma che io chiedete da fan, vedete che ci sono stati a io io li ammazzo, io li ammazzo, te sgarassoni! Sti delinquenti, sono che ti prendono per farlo morire! Ma stai poco! Ma non se ne può più con questi ragazzini! Eh, ma sono ragazzini, no? <ride> ma insomma, la volete piantare? Non si può un attimo le pace dentro sta casa, lavoro tutto il giorno io! Ma il genere di lavoro! Che avete detto? Parlate chiaro, parlate forte! Ma torna a letto che è meglio! Perché? Se no che succede? Non posso più parlare a casa mia? Questa è casa mia, se tu vuoi parlare, parla in camera tua! Noi paghiamo pure il comodo di cucina! Ma Laura, piantala! Ma che piantala che mi sono stufata da vivere dentro sto seraio! Eh, vattene, e chi te ce tiene? Ma insomma, è possibile che dovete litigare? Ah, questa è l'ultima eh, no, no, no. Io se quella non se ne va, un giorno o l'altro... Lei... sarà cotto! Madonna mia, se sarà bruciato tutto! Non lo abbiamo! Colpa di quella scellerata! Chi è qui? È una sorpresa! Mm. La sora Eride sta preparando un dorcetto per domani, per il giorno ah. delle nozze. Uè, non litigherete mica all'ultimo no. momento, mi raccomando! No! Eh, perché? Perché se dovremmo fare una magnata! <ride> no.
With Roma Città Aperta, the figure of Roberto Rossellini leapt into the foreground, almost overshadowing Lucchino Visconti, who remained inactive until La Terra Trema in 1947, except for his part in a collective film about the resistance called Sogni di Gloria. Rossellini's first visits to the offices of Cinema magazine in those years were due more to the fact that he was directing Un Pilota Ritorna than to his work as a journalist or theoretician. The offices of the company producing the film were located in the same building as Cinema in Rome. Both the magazine and the production company were run by Vittorio Mussolini, who somehow tolerated the restlessness of his young collaborators on the magazine and the anti-rhetorical and tight style of the movie Rossellini was directing. Undoubtedly, the Duce's son had no idea where his love for American movies and for less conformist regime movies and propaganda would lead him. But it certainly offered the group in Piazza della Pilota some golden opportunities. On the other hand, the wind of opposition was blowing in that direction. And Giuseppe De Santis's incessant, intense column for cinema was making its mark. We should keep in mind that these factors may well have contributed to accelerating the process of change provoked by the war and the crisis of fascism. It was a crisis that many intellectuals and filmmakers were beginning to suffer personally. It is no accident that Rossellini wanted Giuseppe De Santis to work with him as a scriptwriter and assistant director after Il Pilota Ritorna in 1943. At the time, De Santis was busy striking violent blows at the regime. Together with the rest of the group, he continuously evoked the shades of Verga as the guardian spirit of literary realism in Italian cinema. We would be underestimating Rossellini if we thought that, with that sponge-like sensitivity of his, he did not absorb their innovative way of looking at things. But after Visconti, the ideal candidate to continue Ossessione's explicit statement was certainly De Sica. His candidacy came out of his well-known participation in many intellectual and artistic circles of the 30s. These groups had already started to transform the literary and figurative landscapes. Their members were Moravia, Vittorini, Pabese, Brancati, and Gutuso. And De Sica, with Shusha, did not disappoint anyone. This film went far beyond any expectations.
Dove è mamma e papà? Mamma e papà ti stanno qui, sono morti. E bobo, bu, bu. Capisci? E bobo, bu, bu. Rossellini's Paesà was released in Paris along with Roma Città Aperta and played a part in promoting Shusha, then showing on Italian and foreign screens. This was the initial definition of the school's general tendencies, a movement which foreign critics later generously extended to various kinds of films with various tendencies, certainly much more generously than Italian critics. Of the many sequences of Paisin, we have chosen one which is not often quoted, but which we feel is exemplary in underlining one of neorealism's fundamental characteristics. Together with the new and explosive photography, its innovative use of sound, language, dialects, voices, completely different from the frivolous and anonymous sound of earlier movies. Germans left this morning. The place is lousy with mines. Amazing! It took you this long to find that out. Sergeant, I'm sorry, but you just don't speak Italian in a hurry. Don't take your time to talk to these people. Take it easy, kid. You know what you're doing. Just take your time. Quanti erano i tedeschi? Tanti figli, tanti erano. Cento mila più, più ancora. Cento mila, trenta milioni. Say, kid, if you don't understand this stuff, say so. We'll forget the whole thing. Ask them where the crowds went, will you? Okay, fatti si sono diretti. Non potete dirmi la. Questo scaprino, andiamo forse verso il nord. Chi sta sicuro? This guy says the crowds went north. Well, I guess that's as much as we'll get out of them. Ask them if they know where the mines are. E dove hanno messo le mine? Sulla costiera per andare a nord, solo per la lava si può passare. È pericoloso passare di notte. E ci volesse qualcuno che non uscisse lasciata come Carmela. Ha già due volte che vuole scappare per gli insigni che sono compagni. The only clear way is through the Bevano Lava Canal. He says it'll be rough going. Vieni, devi venire con me. Find out. Vieni. Che marrone si vede? 
Sì, sì, una sigaretta. Per me, la chiesa sull'americana che devono parlare. A me, Tony. Oh, sei tu che conosci la strada dalla lava? Tutti io la faccio per portare un pranzo a me pezzo. Ma che c'è? Sentiero o la strada? È lava. Ma non c'è nessuno che ce la può indicare? Qualcuno di tuoi? No, me frate e me pezzo sono fuori da quattro giorni. Due volte che tento della sala la chiesa per cercare a Rigi. Hanno paura di mandare a me c'è sola. Vi ci accompagno. Conosci bene la strada. Vengo con voi. Ma figlia, non ci puoi dire nessuno a questa gente sconosciuta. Ma non è va? Come va? Bei uns gibt's keinen Rückzug. Morgen gibt's einen Gegenangriff und da werden sie laufen wie die Hasen. Bis nach Ägypten. Ach, bis zum Teufel. We can safely say that as neorealism gathered strength, especially after the emotional reaction to films such as Shusha and Paisa, the questions we asked ourselves about our own identity became more searching. We asked ourselves who we were and where we were going. We were quite probably in the same condition as Stendhal's famous hero, who, when he found himself in the midst of the great battle, had no idea of the battle's general nature or the historical importance of the events he was experiencing. There were many projects that remained on the drawing board between 1943 and 1947-48. They were a living example of how belligerent we were, and yet at the same time completely different and oriented in a different direction. For example, while Giuseppe De Santis worked on Ossessione with Visconti, or Il Sole Sorge Ancora, he also was planning to adapt a subtle French intimist novel by Alain Fournier. Le Grand Meuls. Visconti mused over adapting Thomas Mann's Early Sorrow as he was planning a film about the resistance in Rome with Alicata and De Santis, Gap, which also remained in the planning stages. De Sica and Zabatini considered adapting Flaubert's Cœur Simple as they jotted down their early notes for a film treatment on the unemployed, later to become Ladri di Biciclette. There was a great variety of intention here and a diversity of taste that intertwined within this heterogeneous group of filmmakers working on different themes with completely different styles at the same time. Perhaps it was this multiformity that raised so many questions and created so many problems for critics and film historians. It is certainly true that when we study the period today, we face the same questions and problems. There is really one key question that we must answer today. Did neorealism really exist? Was it really and truly a break with the past? These questions and others come to mind as we examine neorealism today, but they have been creeping up since 1946 since those four or five films, but we can add others, change the panorama of Italian cinema. Before continuing our tour of this panorama, we too want to find some answer to these questions, especially the basic issue. What was neorealism? Breaking with the past. Breaking with the past in any art whatsoever does not necessarily mean starting from scratch all over again. Great formal revolutions in the figurative or plastic arts often took place with small changes in the figure or in the relationship the figure had with its background. Changes which took place over the course of decades. Certain ratios of perspective, for example, took decades for architecture to change. It is thus clear that even the most innovative artists always make use of the materials and styles tradition makes available. 
Let's try to observe the first neorealist films in greater detail and analyze the manner and scope of their difference from the cinema of the previous decades from a formal and anthropological point of view. Let's take any theme whatsoever. Let's take a look at crowds, at collective life. The images fascism used during its 20 or so years of power in propaganda, both in films and newsreels, and in posters and publications, treated crowds as a passive amalgam, an indistinct, orderly, militarized mass. They were also seen as a colorful, vociferous, applauding chorus that formed a passive backdrop for one character or another. In other words, the crowd was folklore. It was the populist rural collectivity that corresponded to fascist populism. In historical films, Carmine Gallone's Scipione L'Africano, for example, it became a metaphor of the present, the eternal crowd maneuvered by a charismatic leader. Look at the difference in this famous mass scene from Il Sole Sorge Ancora, directed by Aldo Bergano, a scene that should certainly be cited in our anthology of Italian neorealistic cinema. This sequence has a precedent. Blasetti's film 1860, which tells of the deeds and popular figures that were the heroes of the year when Italy was unified. On the other hand, popular figures and expressions were certainly not missing during the 30s in the cinema of Blasetti, Camerini, Matarazzo. The difference is that in the neorealist period, what had previously been isolated peaks became a vast known territory explored far and wide by an entire group of filmmakers. Voices called other voices, and these were the building blocks of an entire world of filmmaking. Quando parliamo, citiamo sempre nostra madre. Mater purissima, mater castissima, mater inviolata, mater intenerata, mater amabilis, mater admirabilis, mater boni consigli, mater creatoris, mater salvatoris, virgo prudentissima, Virgo veneranda, ora pronobis. Virgo predicanda, ora pronobis. Virgo potens, ora pronobis. Virgo clemens, ora pronobis. Virgo fidelis, ora pronobis. Speculum justitiae, ora pronobis. Sede sapientiae, ora pronobis. Causa nostra letizia, ora pronobis. Vas onorabile, ora pronobis. Vas insigne devozioni, ora pronobis. Rosa mistica, Turis Davidica, Turis Eburnea, Domus Aurea, Federis Arca, Iano Arcelli, Bella Matutina, Salus Infirmorum, Refugium Peccatorum, Consolatris Afflictorum, Silium Christianorum, Regina Patriarcarum, Regina Patriarcarum, Regina Patriarcarum, Regina Patriarcarum, Regina Patriarcarum, Regina
The chorus was certainly not passive here. Here, the mass became active through a series of internal impulses springing from the relationship between one frame and another, between one individual and another. A collective effort gave the mass movement. This had nothing to do with the story itself, the tale of a moment from the war and the conflict between oppressors and the oppressed. It happened because of the dialectics that arose within the crowd itself, as we see individuals begin to interact and become active participants. The same thing is true for the sequence of Roma Città Aperta, when we see Anna Magnani's fury burst out from an already feverish crowd, a crowd ripe for a cry of rebellion. <laughs> And now let's look at landscapes, the great natural setting, the great stage of exteriors that cinema has used for its characters from the moment of its birth. The dominant setting in neorealistic cinema is the great urban periphery. Generally speaking, there is a horizontal linearity, roads that are lost in infinity, the long banks of the Po Valley, as in Visconti's Ossessione, and in Antonioni's Gente del Po, and the film by Latoada and De Santis that we will speak of later on. All this is the exact opposite of the virile, majestic, plastic verticality that we find in the cinema, the images, and the architecture of the 1920s and 30s. Neorealistic waterscapes are linear as well. Water serves as a disquieting counterpoint to the human events in the background. Its stillness or slow movements and ripples a different stuff from the type of water found in the Ma Nostrum of the Imperial Seas or the Seas of Folk Tales. Let's leave aside for the moment any discussion on the newness of neorealism's contents, the resistance, various social problems, the lack of jobs. Let's relegate it to a secondary role. It is better for the moment to study the variations neorealism brought about under a deeper light, less tied to the chronicles of history. 
Let's look at neorealism from an anthropological point of view. For example, the number of social classes represented increased in neorealist cinema. There is another, even more curious phenomenon that Gian Piero Brunetta studied in detail in his history of Italian cinema. There is even an exchange of roles within the traditional social functions. Children, so often present in neorealist cinema, are frequently forced to take on the roles of men. Women too often find themselves in the position of carrying out traditional male roles. Many a time, a civilian is drawn by events into playing the role of a soldier. The priest becomes a fighter. Almost an attempt to reveal, among other things, the formation of an even wider unity than that of the Risorgimento. di ruoli che il cinema del dopoguerra mette in luce, cioè donne coinvolte in funzioni maschili. The reversal of roles depicted in post-war movies, women doing men's jobs, civilians in military roles, etc., is summed up in the now famous sequence from Paisa set in Florence. This reversal of social and anthropological roles, so evident in all neorealist cinema, is even more effective than the new subjects addressed in revealing the latent and potential stirrings in Italian society in those years. As we have seen, the cinema changed its way of proposing the figurative, rhythmic relationship between individual and chorus, individual and mass, and between event and landscape, as well as completely upsetting the organization of traditional social roles. As it did so, it was part of the general process of cultural transformation going on in Italian society an independent, active process that violently pushed aside tradition. Now that we have established the new limits of neorealism's formal conventions, it is of little importance whether and how much they were conscious choices, and now that we have ascertained the fact that they can be seen in films by directors with extremely different aims, either explicitly or in their unstated intentions, we can travel through the years that followed 1946. Our reference points will be clearer, and it will be easier to draw a portrait of Italian neorealism.